Welcome to this uh, roundtable discussion on uh, the future of uh, aortic valve replacement. My name is Lars Sandergaard. I'm an intervention cardiologist based in Copenhagen, Denmark. Uh, this roundtable discussion is following the three PCR webinars sponsored by Abbott. The first one was about the importance of hemodynamic performance of biprostatic aortic valve. Second webinar addressed uh, the issue about coronary access after TAVI procedures. And the third one, about challenging access and parvalvar leak. I'm very pleased to be joined by two good friends and colleagues here. Uh, Leonard Conradi is a cardiac surgeon based in Hamburg in Germany, and Niklas van Meehem, an uh, interventional cardiologist from Rotterdam in, in the Netherlands. So I said before, we're going to look a little bit into the future. Uh, what do we think is going to happen for indication and treatment of uh, patients with aortic stenosis? We have seen the new guidelines uh, pushing the limit for TAVI down, particularly the American guidelines is suggesting TAVI down to patient at 65 years of age. And of course, if you're going to treat patients with much longer life expectancy, 20 or 30 years, there will be a number of issues we need to consider very carefully before we start this journey for the patients. So Leonard, as a cardiac surgeon, how, how do you see this uh, lifetime journey for a patient with aortic stenosis who is early 60s. Yeah, thanks and welcome everyone. It's a pleasure to be here with, with two great colleagues of mine. So first of all, I think there's a great message to all of our patients as well as our peers because, you know, the fact that we can now choose from two very good therapies for one disease actually is a good uh, message for patients, right? Uh, we can much better respect individual expectations of patients with heart stenosis. We can much more try and work towards tailor-made therapy algorithms and so forth. On the other hand, you know, this also makes things a little more complicated. You know, in former times, we had um, one treatment and one treatment only, and I have to say self-critically so, that this led to a little bit of paternalistic approach to the disease and treatment where uh, physicians tended to somehow almost dictate the therapy. I think these days should very definitely be over. And this has been worded very explicitly in the guidelines saying that patient wish is one central pillar of everything we do. This may come as a no brainer, but it only makes sense today where we have these options. And one last sentence maybe towards surgical perspective. You know, I'm, uh, I've had the privilege to be doing both therapies for a number of years now and being freed from, you know, the, um, the constraints of maybe professional uh, uh, work. So I do tend to hope that I'm uh, kind of neutral and uh, I experience it in the way I described that this is a great time for patients because they have a choice from two excellent therapies. Yeah, I, I agree with that, Leonard. I think um, we are definitely in the midst of the era of shared decision making. And it's all about informing our patients, trying to be neutral, as, uh, as you mentioned, and, you know, provide the information that we have on the pro and cons of the two treatment options that are on the table. And um, yeah, some some patients might favor then a transcatheter-based uh, approach. Uh, another patient might favor a surgical approach. But I think um, what I like about the American approach is that, you know, when you think bioprosthesis, please also have then a transcatheter option in mind. And, and I think that makes sense. But that doesn't mean that every patient at age 65 would require a transcatheter valve. Sometimes a surgical bioprosthesis is still the better option. And sometimes, yeah, it is. we are a little bit in doubt. And both options might be, uh, might be a good way to go for a, for a particular patient. So maybe I can follow up on that, uh, Nicolas. So, so when we treat this patient, of course, durability of this valve is going to be a concern. But durability is only... One part of the story is also because all vibrostatic valve is eventually going to fail if the patient lives long enough. So we also need to have a have a, a strategy, a plan for how we're going to revalve these patients. So let's say we're going to do TAVI in these very young patients with a very long life expectancy. 
should we have any concern or can you just tell us about what, what you have to, to consider up front? Yeah, so, so lifetime management is a hot topic uh, when we talk about uh, treating younger patients with a longer life expectancy, because rightfully so, we uh, we anticipate that these transcatheter valves will also at one point degenerate, and so you would require a revalving procedure. Uh, therefore, the stakes are quite high in these younger patients in terms of uh, valve positioning. Uh, you want to be very cognizant of the coronary arteries and uh, the, the concept of commissural alignment should be uh, applied in, uh, in basically every TAVI procedure these days because you really want to avoid issues with coronaries because of malaligned um, posts. But also we know that up to 50% of patients with aortic stenosis also have coronary artery disease. So coronary accessibility is also a very important notion. But again, these commercial alignment techniques are maturing. Uh, and I do feel that uh, they are becoming part of everyday TAVI practice. So, so, so Leonard, um, let's say we're going to start out uh, treating the patient with a TAVI procedure and 10, 15 years later, that will be generated and patient will be, let's say, mid the 70s. One option will, be, of course, be to take the patient to uh, the OR and, uh, and explain this TAVI valve. Uh, is that something which is straightforward or is it going to be a difficult surgical procedure? Well, it, I think it's a wide array. You know, it can be difficult. It can be a straightforward procedure. And because that is so, I think it needs to be uh, contemplated at the time point of the index procedure already. You know, if you were treating an elderly, heavily comorbid patient, like we did in the few years ago, then maybe a safe, effective index procedure was all it took, right? But those days are certainly over. So. I think what I could only echo what Nicholas has been saying, we have to offer the patients or find out with the together with the patients what their expectations for the coming, let's say 20 years are. Would they be willing to take on the heavy impact surgical AVR at the index? Uh, maybe giving them the longest stretch until subsequent therapy, or are they now in a, in a situation in their lives where they do not want that heavy impact kind of procedure. And I think we could also, now that we're you know, moving away from the former risk adjudicated indication, which we're not anymore, right? It's more and more becoming a matter of life expectancy, maybe of anatomy even, you know, expected hemodynamics, parallel leakage and so forth. Would that patient rather have a light procedure where he can return to normal life quick knowing that he might need subsequent therapy, which then in, a, in, in turn could mean surgery. And if so, that would certainly uh, uh, demand of us to select the correct uh, valve uh, at mm -hmm. the beginning. Was it a tavern valve? Yeah, so anatomical phenotypes really co-determine that decision. And, and also from a surgical perspective, I, I, I feel that the surgical community also is, has become more sensitive of these um, techniques like aortic root enlargement, also the concept of smaller bioprosthesis. Um, there are some, uh, you know, I think a surgeon now will think twice to implant a 21 millimeter uh, surgical bioprosthesis, for instance, because he or she has in mind that the patient will come back uh, with a degenerated valve at one point in life. And then obviously you also want to have an optimal uh, transcatheter valve option just in case you want to treat them uh, that failed bioprosthesis with a transcatheter option. I so Nicholas, we, we, we heard that if you want to do an explantation of this transcatheter hyperblade on, it may in some cases be quite difficult uh, procedure. So what about doing a TAVI and TAVI? What concerns is related to that kind of procedures? Yeah, so I think that the, the major concerns are the coronaries, but also the valve hemodynamic performance. Uh, this is uh, what we already uh, discussed earlier. Commissural alignment is very important at the index procedure, not only for the coronaries, but also for the hemodynamic valve performance. There are some signals in the literature that commissural, that optimized commissural aligned valves 
that they also perform better in terms of valve hemodynamics, and that might also lead to a more durable procedure. So that's at the index procedure. When a transcatheter valve um, comes to degenerate, then obviously uh, you have to again be very uh, cognizant uh, of uh, these um, neo commissures and, and this, this neo seals that exist when you start uh, revalving and pushing away the, the degenerated valves. So I think um, when you do a redo procedure, um, you definitely have to redo your CT planning. And you have to be very um, careful about where the coronaries are, how, where is the framework of the valve? Is it in front of the coronaries? Is it below? Was it commissural aligned? Yes or no? And you also have to be aware of where are the leaflets located? Is it an intra-annular functioning valve, for instance, um, the Navitor or a Portico system? Or is it a supra-annular valve, for instance, an Evolute valve? That also plays a role when you do a revolving procedure. That's great. So we discussed here, you know, the new indications for patients with uh, severe symptomatic autic stenosis mm -hmm. going to younger patients. But there's also talk about this, some, some we call it upstream target to try to intervene early on. Leonard, um, a patient who got a severe aortic stenosis but still uh, asymptomatic, there's discussion to treat this patient. Can, can you enlighten us what evidence do we have so far and, and what can, evidence can we expect in the near future on, in, on this topic? Yeah, I think it's a very important topic um, because I, I do believe that the classical triggers for treatment are somewhat, you know, in, are becoming, to, are, there's good reason to doubt them nowadays. Um, not only if you're considering transcatheter valves, also if for surgery. And there's some early indicators now within trials that early surgery in asymptomatic, so-called asymptomatic severe optic stenosis might be beneficial to prevent uh, uh, serious adverse events down the further down the road. And I, do, I, I mean, it does make sense, you know, the, if you consider the hemodynamics of severe aortic stenosis, just the fact that the patient doesn't feel it or doesn't feel much or maybe isn't asked in the right way to uh, decipher whether he's feeling anything in terms of symptoms doesn't mean the ventricle isn't, you know, completely stressed out with that valve disease. So for me, it makes a lot of sense pathophysiologically. Um, and also both therapies, TAVR or uh, SAVR are extremely safe. You know, so the hurdle to um, offer these procedures for a prognostic reason, not so much symptom relief reason, uh, are somewhat low, I think. And uh, if treated at a, a decently experienced center, I think this is a field of uh, further uh, of activities for these patients in the future, definitely. Yeah, and I think we have seen in the US uh, this early TAMA trial has completed enrollment. So it's going to be very interesting to see how it's coming out, randomizing patients to, to TAVIA or, or just watch we're waiting. But Nicholas, there's also other indications coming up. Uh, we're talking about patients who do not have a severe but moderate autic stenosis, but at the same time have uh, heart failure and symptoms. Uh, will that be something we should look into in, in the future? No doubt. I think um, this uh, concept of moderate aortic stenosis has become a true target. Uh, there are several data that suggest that moderate aortic stenosis also impacts overall survival, not only in patients with depressed LV function, but also in patients with preserved ejection fractions. Um, there are several trials ongoing. Um, uh, at the end of this year, the Tower Unload trial will come to an end, and this is really focusing on patients with uh, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction and moderate aortic stenosis. And there, um, it seems very intuitive. Uh, heart failure therapies are focused on afterload reduction. Well, if a patient has a depressed LV and there is an increased afterload by the moderate aortic stenosis, intuitively, it makes sense to think about valve replacement. Well, that is the, the it remains to be seen, obviously, in the randomized controlled setting, what the outcomes will be. But um, we are getting closer and closer to the answer to those questions. And um, I do applaud also the newer initiatives to even widen up the spectrum 
uh, and also consider patients with diastolic dysfunction and moderate aortic stenosis. Um, there are some some uh, there is literature both in asymptomatic severe AS, but also in moderate aortic stenosis, that these patients uh, are developing myocardial fibrosis, and that obviously impacts uh, long-term survival. So if we could, we could treat those uh, indications earlier, that might uh, have a beneficial effect on uh, long-term survival. So I think uh, it's, it's exciting times. We see that uh, indication certainly seems to expand not only to patients at younger age, but also to new indication, the asymptomatic severe aortic stenosis and, and moderate aortic stenosis. So it's going to be very exciting how to see this, how this field is going to move the, the next couple of years. Leonard and Nicholas, thanks a lot for your insight and, and for sharing it with, with us. Uh, I think it was a very nice discussion. So hope also you will join it uh, as a participant uh, learn something today. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.